Well, good morning. Just uh, a couple of announcements for you as uh, those of you are uh, tuning in and watching this from home. Uh, if there are any needs that you would have, uh, physical or, or otherwise, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, call the church office. Uh, I will be in uh, this week. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a lot of people that are willing and able to, to help out. So please uh, let us know uh, whatever uh, needs you might have. Uh, and then also just uh, a really encouraging announcement. We've had a, a mass drive that's continuing if you're tuning in today. Uh, it's going on again until 2 today and probably uh, throughout uh, the week. So keep... Uh, Keep uh, posted, keep uh, in tune with uh, announcements and emails that are coming out uh, as to that and, and how you can help out with that. But it was a really encouraging day. Yesterday, I had uh, a lot of uh, masks go out and uh, more to come, so thank you all for that. Uh, let's uh, now uh, turn our attention uh, to uh, what we've been called to do, uh, what God calls us to do, which is to worship Him. So. Uh, if you're at home, uh, please stand uh, wherever you are for the call to worship. This uh, call, Psalm of David, Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek? After lies. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we ask now that you would meet us where we are this morning, that your Holy Spirit would be present with us as we worship you. We ask that you would cause the cares of this world to fade away, even but for a few minutes, that our hearts might be refocused upon you, and that we might have ears to hear and eyes to see the glorious truths that you have recorded for us in your word and preserved for us all these years, that your words might enter into our hearts and encourage us, rebuke us where needed, and point us to your Son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing. Uh, and sing together uh, this glorious hymn, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness.
time of prayer. Let's pray together. Our glorious Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that we can gather this morning and sing praises to you for who you are, for what you have done to secure our salvation only through your Son, Jesus. And we uh, would pray uh, that more and more we might uh, build the foundations of our lives upon these eternal truths, that uh, we might build our identity upon uh, who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Uh, Father, we confess that uh, we have sinned against you, that even though we claim this glorious promise that uh, we uh, are free from sin because of Jesus' blood and righteousness, we are redeemed and eternally yours, uh, we still sin. And we still find ourselves, day after day, even sometimes moment by moment, in need of forgiveness. Continue to soften our hearts for, Lord, uh, they are prone to wander after the things of this world. So forgive us now of uh, those sins that we have committed against you today and uh, this week. Wash us uh, clean of all of these sins. And continue to build us up in our faith as you've promised to do, as we've seen you do in days gone by, continue to be at work in us, sanctifying us, showing us our sin and helping us to learn from uh, these mistakes so that we might be glorious in your sight and learn more and more to enjoy you, your presence in our lives and your rule over our lives. Lord, where there are needs this morning, we pray that you would speak to them. Where there are those who are sad this morning over loss of loved ones, loss of opportunities, loss of uh, work perhaps. Lord, be near to them. Provide for their every need and continue to Point them to yourself. Lord, where there are those who are sat within our congregation and outside of there, we pray for comfort that can only come from you. For those uh, widows and widowers who, uh, even after uh, much time, still mourn the loss of uh, their uh, spouses. Continue to bring healing as only you can. Provide your uh, balm of Gilead upon their hearts and upon their souls. And Father, where there are those who are lonely today, whether it be from uh, social distancing or from uh, uh, just uh, sin itself, bridges that have been burned perhaps, or uh, uh, other reasons, that you would uh, stand near to those who are uh, lonely and that you would raise up your church to uh, speak into the loneliness and the darkness that abides, that the light of Christ might shine there and bring encouragement. Father, we thank you for these uh, eternal truths that we claim uh, as our own. We thank you for Jesus, who is uh, the capstone of all of your uh, many covenants, your many promises. Continue to encourage us according to them and point us forward, making us more and more uh, like Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Be assured, be encouraged of these, uh, of this part that you have been forgiven of your sins. Again, from Psalm 4. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. 
Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Glorious uh, assurance here, especially right at the end. Uh, the, 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 the king, King David, says that he can sleep, he can lie down and sleep. He's at peace, resting in the Lord alone. For it's him that makes him dwell in safety. May you know that measure of peace this week uh, as we look ahead uh, to uh, the future, knowing that God has all of these things uh, in the palm of his hand. Uh, let's uh, stand again and sing this glorious truth. Our God, who was our help in ages past, will be our help uh, for ages to come. Let's stand and sing together. Starting in verse 14. And 
Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff but passing through their midst, he went away. As we uh, look at this uh, opening, this beginning of Jesus' uh, ministry, there's a couple things that uh, jump out at us uh, here. It's uh, interesting, actually, how uh, Luke uh, builds this uh, narrative. It's written in uh, uh, narrative form, that there is a beginning, there is a climax of the story, and then there's a, a resolution right uh, at the end. Uh, and as we begin looking at this, as Luke begins, uh, there's uh, something I think that is important to point out, that uh, as the custom of the day was, we, we don't know actually a lot about uh, the synagogues and the worship in uh, the synagogues. Uh, best guess is that they began sometime around the uh, exile of uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. The temple has been torn down uh, and uh, they, they set up the Jewish people of the time uh, certain rules that you had to have ten uh, elders, ten men uh, present uh, in uh, the synagogue in order for worship to, to happen. Uh, and the, the synagogues eventually grow in, in various towns, they, they pop up, uh, and we see Jesus uh, attending to these uh, synagogues, to the worship that uh, they've been called to. And in verse 16 in particular, I think it's a very telling verse, uh, uh, and Jesus came to Nazareth. Uh, when, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. I think what's so important here, and, and what's not to miss about this, is that this was Jesus' custom. What this means, in other words, is that every Saturday, would have been Saturday at that time, he would have been present in worship. Now, I think most good Christians know that we should attend church on Sunday. And we can even get into this habit of it, and, and that's a, a very good thing. But 
don't miss the importance of why exactly we gather to worship. We gather to worship, first of all, because God calls us to do this. This is what's required of us. But I think even more than just that, uh, we need to focus upon our own hearts and what our hearts are like. And, and, and we as Christians understand the heart a lot better than anybody else. You see, we have these hearts, these motherboards of our very existence, if you will. And constantly, uh, all the time, uh, minute by minute throughout the week, they are torn, they are twisted, they are diverted to this and to that and to the other. Uh, oftentimes pursuing after, most of the time I would argue, pursuing after other things than God himself. And so you ask, why do we uh, gather to worship every week? It's so that our hearts might be refocused upon the one that we were created to worship. You see, as human beings, we have a worship problem. Our hearts are constantly seeking other things, other people, other pursuits, other good things to worship. And God calls us into these houses of worship to have our hearts refocused upon that, upon Him. The story uh, comes from the Scottish Highlands many years ago. Uh, a minister by the name of Thomas Chalmers, well-known story, I think, now, where he had a member of his congregation that stopped coming to worship and uh, finally, Chalmers paid him a pastoral visit one cold and damp uh, Scottish evening. And he got to this uh, member's house and he had a roaring coal fire in the fireplace heating the entire room. And before Chalmers sat down to talk to him, he got up and grabbed tongs from the fireplace and grabbed one coal out of the fire and placed it on the hearth away from the rest of the coals. And as they talked, uh, the coal slowly simmered, went from glowing red hot to in a matter of moments, uh, just a black coal, uh, lifeless and dead and cold on the hearth. And as uh, Chalmers got up to leave, the uh, man and his whole family said, thank you. Pastor Chalmers for the sermon that you gave us tonight. They, they, they under, in other words, they, they got the point. That we gather together to worship so that we might continue to have hearts that are on fire for the Lord. That we uh, gather together, we worship together so that we uh, might know, so that we might encourage one another that as our hearts are refocused, we might also refocus uh, one another. This is why it's so important that we gather together and worship together week in and week out. Second thing we see in this passage this morning is the very purpose for which Jesus came. So often we miss this and we uh, can and oftentimes do miss this. You look down at verses 18 and 19, you see that Jesus rises in the synagogue as, as is his uh, custom, uh, and that he reads this passage from Isaiah uh, 61, uh, the, probably portions of Isaiah 58 and Jesus uh, reading here as well, and, and probably other parts of Isaiah. But Isaiah 61 is where uh, uh, Luke draws this quote from. And what's significant about this is not just what Jesus reads from Isaiah 61, but actually what Jesus doesn't read from Isaiah 61. Now let me, let me read uh, from you, and you follow along in verses 18 and 19. I'll read Isaiah 61, you follow along with verses 18 and 19 uh, of uh, Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to 
that Jesus is going to come and save you from all your worldly problems, all your worldly cares. It should be no surprise to you, hopefully, that when I say that this is not the type of Savior that Jesus is. I don't know about you, but uh, my life, I don't think, really started to get complicated until I actually submitted my life to Jesus. Oftentimes, uh, life gets more complicated, more problematic uh, after our conversions. So beware of that. Be ready for that. Jesus does not come to save us from our worldly problems. Second type of Savior, I think that the Nazarenes thought that Jesus was going to be, was someone that was going to maintain the religious status quo. You see, in other words, they had in their minds uh, the way that salvation worked was through uh, uh, birth, was by their own Jewishness. That's why Jesus goes right to the heart of this. By giving them two examples, uh, Elijah going to the widow of Sidon, she goes, he goes outside of the boundaries of Israel and brings relief to this uh, Gentile woman. And then Naaman the Syrian in the time of Elisha, also a non-Jew, is granted cleansing, is given salvation. But it's not because of his ethnic heritage. This is not how salvation works, in other words. It's not through anything that we do. It's not through anything that we can earn or anything that we deserve by our birth, by our raising. Jesus, salvation is only through Jesus and only by faith in Him. And that's why this last point is such a chilling one. Notice their reaction, these Nazarenes, a moment before they were glorifying Jesus. Now in verse 29, the glory of the elation turns to murderous rage. And one can't help but think when we read earlier of Jesus' temptation by Satan, and we're told that Satan departs to an opportune until, until an opportune time. Is this maybe that opportune time? The people in the synagogue's hearts are enraged at what Jesus has just said to them. Verse 29: They rose up and drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which to throw him down the cliff. Nazareth is in the hill country. A large cliff on the edge of town, they drive Jesus to the very brink before he disappears miraculously into their midst and walks away. But notice verse 30. So chill. Passing through their midst, he went away. Jesus went away. This is his hometown. This is where he grew up. And if you search through the rest of the Gospel of Luke, through the rest of the Gospels altogether, Jesus never returns to Nazareth again. This is it. They don't want him there. They tell him, Jesus, we want you to leave. Get out. And this is what's so unbelievable about this. He does. He leaves them. Never to come again. Let that sink in for just a moment. Jesus leaves. Leaves them to their own devices. Leaves them to the, their own sinful desires of their hearts and never comes back again. There's a great warning here to everybody about squandered opportunities. You remember in seminary, an older gentleman in our class named Clark, very godly man, very gifted man, and, and in the midst of our studying there, uh, Clark was diagnosed with uh, uh, cancer. 
very quickly took his life, but uh, in preaching lab, had a preaching lab with him. And um, after his diagnosis, Clark had that certain perspective that people that know they're going to die uh, oftentimes will have. And so it's, it's absolutely an amazing thing. It's sort of those people that you want to pull your chair up close to and just hang on their every word. I remember one sermon, maybe the last sermon I ever heard uh, Clark preach. He gave the definition of what it is to be a failure. And he said a failure is becoming really, really good at something that doesn't really matter. To become excellent at something that, that, that makes no difference whatsoever in life. That's what it is to truly be a failure. Now, juxtapose that with, with what the world tells us is a failure. And I think you start to see, you start to gather, you get the breadth and the depth of this passage here. That what is it to be a, a, a failure in life? It's to reject Jesus. To say to him, I, I don't really want you in my life, or, or I don't want you in this area or that area of my life. Just go away, Jesus. That is what it is to be a true failure. To not have Jesus be Lord and Savior of every area of your life. Or maybe to say to him, I, I don't want you at all to, to completely reject him. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, don't allow this to happen. If the Lord is speaking to you this morning, if the Spirit is there with you, listen. Get down on your knees and pray and ask forgiveness. Give your life to Him, not just part of it, but all of your life. That's what it is to be truly great in this life, is to be walking shoulder to shoulder with Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is what it is to be truly great in this life, is to not just know Him with your head, but to serve Him with your heart, with every fiber of your being. I beg you this morning, do not squander the opportunities that God is giving to you. Embrace them. Use them for the glory of God and serve Jesus Christ with everything you have. Then you will be truly great and you will shine this light of Jesus into all the world. Don't squander these opportunities. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for coming to us. We thank you for your grace in doing so. We ask by your power you would make us more and more like your son Jesus. Help us to make good on the opportunities that you give us to show his love all around us. Make us truly great, we pray in his name. Let's uh, stand together uh, and sing our closing hymn, which is, He Leaded Me, O Blessed Father.
Father in heaven, we would ask now that uh, you would bless us, that you would keep us, that you would make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Heavenly Father, lift up your countenance unto us and give us peace. In Jesus' name.